from one organism to another. So different organisms have different abilities to synthesize uh, amino acids that they need. In human beings, there's about 10 of each. It kind of depends on the, the, the um, system that you look at. But for our purposes, we'll say there's 10 of each. Essential meaning we have to have these guys in our diet. Non-essential mean, meaning we can, we can synthesize these in metabolic pathways. Well, not surprisingly, there's alanine. I already told you how simple alanine was to make. There's glutamate. Glutamate was very simple to make. There's um, aspartate, very simple to make. Asparagine is simply taking aspartate, put an amine on it, you got that. That's easy to make. Glutamine, take glutamate, put an amine on it, you got that. Okay. So most of these are fairly simple. Here's one of the most elaborate ones that we were able to make is tyrosine. It actually has a, a benzene ring. The more complicated molecules are over here, and we have uh, no ability to make these. We have to have these, gu these guys in our diet, or we are screwed, as it were. All righty, we're moving through here. Um, when we look at, a, at amino acid metabolism, we're thinking now not only about the making of amino acids, but also the breaking down of amino acids. We discover they can be broken into basically three groups. Okay? So now we're looking not at the synthesis of amino acids, but what happens once they're broken down. Amino acids broken down form intermediates in either glycolysis, if so, they're called glucogenic, or intermediates in the citric acid cycle, in which case they're known as ketogenic. There are a few that are both. They make intermediates in both cycles. So that's the three categories. You'll notice that the vast, the biggest group of them make intermediates that are glucogenic. And you might think glucogenic, doesn't that mean make glucose? We're talking about breakdown. Well, the breakdown of one pathway may lead to the synthesis of another pathway. I've already described to you how if I am eating a high protein diet and a low carb diet, all right, I'm breaking down amino acids to make intermediates that I can use to make glucose. That's exactly what's going on with the glucogenic pathway over here. Yes, ma'am, Casey. Which ones? No, nope, I don't ex I expect you're gonna memorize them. No, nope. I see no purpose in that. Yeah, so I think you should know what essential means and non-essential means. I think you should know what the categories mean, but no, I'm not going to expect you to memorize which ones are in which categories. Unless you want to. Yes? So they have a limited ability to go out and get them. You know, it's a very good question. Robert's question was, he assumes plants have no um, essential amino acids since they have no ability to go out and get them. I don't know that's completely the case. Um, I can envision some plants might, in fact, have some essential amino acids because they do have symbiotic relationships with bacteria uh, in their roots and may rely on those. So I wouldn't say it's an absolute thing. But yes, I would tend to agree with you that plants would probably have less in terms of requirements than uh, animals would because of, for the very reason that you stated. And then you think about those, those carnivorous plants, right? Pretty cool. There's, there's some very uh, interesting things that have, have come up in carnivorous plants in the past year or so. So if anybody's interested in that, come talk to me. I'll tell you about a couple cool things with carnivorous plants that we, we now know. You may know them yourselves. OK. Now we turn our attention, we're back talking about nitrogen again. And of course, I was talking about nitrogen sort of indirectly with all those. But now we have to get back and think about these toxic um, things that are produced as nitrogen in nitrogen metabolism. I've alluded to these a little bit. Ammonia is, of course, NH3. I put ammonia in water. I make ammonium ion, and that's NH4+. Plus. So as I say, I use those two, two terms interchangeably, and in fact, both of these are, in high concentrations, poisonous. Um, if you maintain aquariums, you'll notice that one of the things that happens with aquariums over time is they do develop um, an amine uh, smell to them. And that's because all that nitrogen in that aquarium isn't going anywhere. 
and all the excretions of the fish are accumulating, 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 and if, if allowed to accumulate long enough, they will, in fact, kill the fish if you don't clean your aquarium out. So that's one example of nitrogen metabolism. As I said, one of the ways that we balance the um, amount of nitrogen that we have in our body is by the excretion of urea. So the more nitrogen that we're intaking, the more output we're putting of urea. And one of the, the, the um, interesting questions I get at this point, and it's kind of, it's kind of a dumb question, but I'll, I'll answer the question before I get it and don't embarrass somebody, is sometimes when I take a pee, it really smells. Is that urea? Well, maybe. But most commonly when people have a problem with smelling their pee, okay, you guys didn't think we were talking about this in biochem, did you? It's because they've eaten asparagus, okay? And if you ever trace back, I get smiles, but it's true. If you ever trace back when you've noticed odor with urination, you'll notice that it is often traced to asparagus that you've had. It doesn't take very much. And the odor that you get is not the urea. It's actually methionine. I learned this myself in the past couple of years, so I spread this, this knowledge to you guys, okay? Methionine is apparently fairly rich in asparagus, and even a little bit of it comes right through your system. Your kidneys say, okay, we're going we're gonna, to uh, filter that out, and it goes out, and that's what you get. So that's not urea when you, when you notice that. But you do, in fact, excrete urea um, as a way of balancing nitrogen. I mentioned last time that birds and Dalmatians, for example, excrete uric acid as their way of getting rid of excess nitrogen. They don't make urea. Now, uric acid is a problem, and it's an interesting problem. We make uric acid. We make uric acid um, in uh, a, a pathway that I'll show you in a bit. But I'll tell you the problem, and then I'll show you the pathway later. So the problem with uric acid is that we, we make it as a breakdown product for purines, like adenine and guanine. Okay? So we make uric acid there. And uric acid, the nitrogen and so forth, can be converted into urea, ultimately. So we can excrete that. Okay, so we don't excrete uric acid. But we have uric acid in our body. What's the problem with uric acid? The problem is that uric acid is fairly water insoluble. This is why Dalmatians have a bit of a problem. It's fairly water insoluble, meaning it doesn't dissolve very well in water. And once you make too much of it, it starts forming crystals. Okay. So when you start forming crystals, those crystals are pulled by gravity, usually to the lowest place in your body. And those crystals, when they form in the lowest part of your body, frequently hit your big toe. And your big toe may have excruciating pain. The excruciating pain is known as gout. Gout comes from production of too much uric acid. It can be very hilarious if you don't have it and very painful if you do have it. So we think about people with big toes hurting, et cetera, et cetera, and we think, wow, it's a problem. But it's a real problem because it can be extraordinarily painful to people who have it. Gout used to be known as the rich man's disease because only people who had very rich diets, not unlike what we currently, all of us have now, tended to get it. Okay? So we have treatments for gout, and it makes it go away. But an interesting uh, aspect about gout that is not fully understood, but it's intriguing, I think, is that people who have gout tend to have a lower incidence of multiple sclerosis. The link is not understood, and it's thought that uric acid may provide a bit of an antioxidant protective effect such that it's stopping some of the things that ultimately lead to multiple sclerosis. So it's not known completely why um, that's the case, but that's one of the things that happens with gout. So the reason I was talking about Dalmatians the other day being sore and sickly is because they're making uric acid, they're not making urea, they don't have an extra way of getting rid of that excess nitrogen, and as a consequence, they frequently have these crystals forming. They look like a walking case of gout, and so they can oftentimes be in pain and have a variety of problems. You have a question? Well, how does anything travel in your body? It's through your bloodstream. Is your yeah. Uh -huh. Is that not hazardous to So, yeah, so a question is, is that not hazardous to clotting and things like that? Clotting arises as a result of action of other, other stimuli. So that's not a problem there. If you had a big crystal of it, then yes, it would be a problem for the flow of, of any blood. 
But uric acid crystals, you have to realize, are very, very tiny, and they're, only, they're, they're going down and they're accumulating. So they're, um, as far as I know, not a problem for anything. If anything, what they would affect would be capillaries, would not be affecting an artery or something like that. Thank goodness. Yes, Sue? Yeah, it's a good question. So it turns out that diets that are very rich in purines are, uh, the, uh, are linked to gout. How do you get a lot of purines? A lot of red meat and red wine. Red wine is full of purines. So I challenge you, if you guys really want to follow your own bodies and follow your processes, if you drink much red wine on some occasion, I want you to think about the next morning when you wake up, does your toe hurt? And I think in some cases, you, I've actually heard from people who have said this, you will find that in some cases it does. So that's kind of interesting. Okay? So that uric acid really uh, is an interesting uh, compound. Other questions? Yeah. There are treatments for people with gout. So the, the treatments inhibit the synthesis of uric acid in the first place and sort of bypass that. So the treatments are pretty good. Uh, they don't want to do it for Dalmatians because the dogs have to excrete. Otherwise, they're going to get uremia from having too much nitrogen. So that's not, a, not, that's not an option for the Dalmatians. Uh, the treatment that's given to dogs uh, of that are typically pain, you know, pain related and so forth. And not treat, because if you treated uric acid, you probably would kill the dog. That's not a good career move. Yes, uh, Julia. Yes, uric acid, you're making it, and it, you break it down ultimately to urea. So yes, you do have a mechanism for breaking it down. Question? Okay. How am I doing on time? Okay. All right, here's what happens with uric acid. No, you're not going to memorize this, all right? But uric acid goes to elantoin, elantoin goes to elantoinoic acid. Okay, another glyoxalate comes off. There's our friend glyoxalate showing up everywhere. And the byproduct of that is urea. So we're making this in the process of what, one of the ways in which we can make urea. And urea, you'll notice, has two amines on it. It's a very effective way of getting rid of nitrogens quickly. Urea, of course, is very water soluble. So we don't have problems with that. And as a consequence, it goes out of our urine, not out of our feces, which is where uric acid comes out. Okay, and the urea cycle. Let's talk about the urea cycle. Oh yeah, Sue. I'm not that Sue. I'm sorry. Yeah. Nope. We can make glyoxalate. We just can't do anything with it. We 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 have virtually nothing we can do with glyoxalate. And we have other things that we make that we can't do a lot with. So they're going to get excreted from the body as well. OK, good question. Thanks for pointing it out. OK, so there's a cycle. No surprise. We have a cycle of urea. And the cycle of urea is involved in balancing nitrogen. So no, we're not going to memorize the structures. No, we're not even going to memorize the sequence of intermediates. But I think you should know the intermediates of the cycle. I think they're kind of interesting, OK? Two of them are, people asked me early, are amino acids. They're amino acids that don't show up in proteins. Ornithine and uh, citrulline. Here's an amino acid, OK? There's the amine, there's the acid. And ornithine, over here, ornithine. There's the amine, there's the acid. So there's two examples of amino acids that we have in our body that are not put into protein. They participate in the urea cycle. You can see that the urea cycle actually, uh, if we start over here with uh, ornithine, gets transported into the mitochondria. And in the mitochondria, we have some reactions that occur that make citrulline. Again, the order of these is not important. Citrulline comes out and is converted. And this is just an intermediate that you don't have to worry about. But citrulline comes out and is made into arginino-succinate. What a mouthful of a name. Arginino-succinate. Sounds like arginine, and in fact, it breaks down into arginine and fumarate. So we see here that some of the offshoots of the urea cycle, 
fumarate for one is capable of being metabolized in the citric acid.